So our, our next uh, speaker will be Nico Lehman. Uh, so he's going to be talking about this language you might have heard of called Rust that has this thing called types. Uh, apparently its type system is quite nice and people like it. And he'll be telling us how to make Rust type system even better. Hello, everyone. So today I'm going to talk to you about how we can do um, language-based type-based verification in, in Rust using refinement types. Uh, but beyond that, I'm going to try to convince you that we can use types to make verification easier. Uh, and our key feature to do that, like our key ingredient, are refinement types. So let's start by a brief overview of what refinement types are. So in a traditional presentation, refinement types have this form. It's composed of a value name, a base type, and a refinement. And intuitively, they denote the set of values x of some type b that satisfies some predicate p. In, in our context, these uh, refinements p are uh, taken from a decidable logic, and we take, we take this decidable like, very seriously. Uh, and a consequence of that is that we don't, want, uh, we don't have quantifiers. Uh, and we do this to have like, one uh, uh, type checking decidable, but also predictable. And I'm going to come back to this restriction of not having quantifiers later in the, in the talk. This is a very simple example. Um, we can define the set of uh, the type of positive numbers by restricting integers uh, to those that are greater than zero. So once we have refinements on base values, we can use it to specify the behavior of functions. This is showing the type of a function that generates a sequence of integers within a range. When we use a refinement on an input type, we can specify preconditions. In this case, uh, we're saying that the second argument has to be greater than the first. And when used at the output type, they can be used to specify a post condition. Uh, in this case, that all the elements in the list are within the range. Uh, so refinement types have been very successful in the functional uh, world. They've been using tools like liquid Haskell and fstart to verify various sorts of properties. So that begs the question, can we use uh, the same techniques in imperative code, or this is only something that we can use in functional code? So refinement types, um, it's, a, it's challenging to, to do this for imperative code because the very notion of the refinements uh, gets complicated. Like, what does it mean to, for a variable to have a refinement or to depend on a variable if the variable can change over time? So our solution to this is Flux uh, that shows how we can use the ownership mechanism of the Rust programming language to extract a pure fragment that we can safely depend on. So the rest of the talk is going to be very simple. First, I'm going to tell you how we extend the Rust type system with refinements. And then I'm going to tell you how these refinements interact with ownership uh, in a way that allow us to verify it in private code. Uh, in Flex, we have three uh, main extensions to the type system. There are index types, refinement parameters, and existential types. And index types allows you to attach um, refinement value to a, um, to a type that we call the index. Um, and it lets you carry extra information about the type. Uh, the exact meaning of the index depends on the type. Uh, for example, we can index primitive integers by the pure integer they're equal to. And for example, type the expression 2 plus 3 as i32 indexed by 5. And similarly, we can index booleans by the boolean they're equal to and type the expression 3 less than 10 as bool equal true. The next extension are refinement parameters in Flex function types can be parameterized by a refinement value. And in essence, they behave like ghost uh, values that we, at call side, we instantiate automatically and pass into the, the, the functions. And, um, and just to have like a nicer syntax, we have this uh, at notation that lets you declare um, a parameter implicitly without having a explicit quantification. Finally, we have existential types. These existential types look more like the ones I showed you at the beginning um, and let you define a set of values that satisfy some property. And to see an example of that, I'm going to show you a, a more complete function uh, that combines all the features I've told you so far. This is the, um, an implementation of an absolute value function that uses a refinement parameter to quantify over the value the input is equal to and uses an existential type to say both that the output is um, non-negative and also greater than the, than the input. So those are basically the, uh, the refinement extensions we have to the type system. So let's move on, on to how they interact with the uh, ownership mechanism of Rust. 
I'm going to talk about three different mechanisms. The first two that I'm calling own locations and borrowed references are standard Rust concepts. The, what is new here is how they interact with refinements. Uh, the third one that I'm calling strong references is something new that we have to add to the Rust ownership system um, to handle some cases that arise in, in refinement type checking. In Rust, every value has, a, is, has an owner, is owned by a local variable, uh, which means that whenever we update through uh, a variable, um, we uh, know that no other uh, pointer can be, be accessing that value, which means in the context of refinements that we can do an extra update and change the refinement we have on, on that uh, value. Uh, and this allows us to precisely track uh, properties about the values uh, in different locations. Now, ownership is a powerful concept, uh, but any of you that have um, like written some Rust codes uh, know that explicitly passing the ownership between functions can become very cumbersome uh, like very quickly. So Rust has this uh, concept of borrowing um, that lets you temporarily transfer the ownership of some location. Um, and it does it in, uh, by means of two type of references, shared and immutable. So a shared reference is typically presented as allowing aliasing, but no mutation. Uh, which in the context of refinement types means that because we don't know that the location cannot be mutated by any other pointer, that we can safely assume the refinements we have on that value and effectively pack some invariant inside the reference. So in this example, I'm, I'm showing a function that takes a, a reference to a value that we guarantee is positive, and when I read from it, uh, I can be sure that the value will uh, satisfy that refinement. Mutable reference are uh, a bit more subtle. Typically, they're presented as allowing mutation, but no aliasing. So like exclusive ownership, uh, they guarantee exclusive access, but um, we don't know exactly which location they may be pointing to. It may be a location that we don't know aesthetically. Uh, th this means that whenever we update through a refinement, we, through a mutable reference, we have to preserve our refinements because there, there may be some other pointer uh, that has some expectations on that location, so we must satisfy those uh, expectations. In practice, this means that whenever we try to update through a middle reference, uh, if we do so in a way that we cannot prove that the invariant is preserved, then Flux will reject the code. If we want to do such an update, then we have to explicitly check uh, that the invariance will be preserved, like I show you in this example. Um, so many of you may have noticed that uh, I mean, uh, allowing mutable reference to pack some invariant can be useful, but uh, probably you've noticed that this has some limitations. Um, and, and to show this limitation, I have this example. So suppose we have a, um, a function that starts, uh, initializes a value z with 10, um, and then we take a mutable reference to it and call the decker function as we defined it before. Um, because it, the type of the function only tells me that after the function returns, uh, the value will be positive, I cannot prove that it will be exactly nine, right? So that's something we would like to do. Um, and that's why we introduced the concept of strong references. So strong references is a special case of a mutable reference, uh, but um, they ensure uniqueness of a known location. Um, so when we know the exact location we're pointing to, then we can safely up, uh, up strong update the type of a, of a location. And we do that by extending the signature of a function with these short clauses that let us uh, annotate the type of a location after the function returns. Okay, no, in my experience, this is where people get confused when I'm explaining this. So I'm going to try to um, explain the difference between a strong and mutable reference uh, a bit more clearly. So in this example, um, I'm declaring two var local variables, x and y. And based on some condition, I'm taking a reference to either x or y and storing the, the result in r. So in each branch, before, uh, before the, the, the branches join, flux know exactly if I take a reference to x or y, Flux knows exactly the location I'm pointing to, so I can do a strong updates on it. But as soon as we uh, merge the control flow and we lose track of which location we're pointing to, uh, Flux autom will automatically pack it in a mutable reference by inferring some invariant that is true for all the, the locations we could possibly point to. Uh, um, from, now on, uh, from now on, we cannot uh, call the, the stronger version of Decker, but we only can call the, the weaker one that only preserves the invariant. Okay, so I hope I convince you that we um, can make refinements and imperative updates uh, coexist in, in Rust um, by leveraging the ownership mechanisms. 
uh, I guess I still have to convince you that this makes verification easier. Um, so for that, I'm gonna show you a bit, um, um, a bit more complex example um, by means of a refined vectors API. So these vectors are indexed by the length, by an integer which is supposed to represent their length. So this is how I will, for example, define empty vectors by indexing them by zero, uh, or non-empty vectors um, by using an existential type. Crucially, the type of vectors is polymorphic, so we can instantiate it with any refinement types. Uh, which means that even though our refinements don't have quantifiers, we can still express quantifying invariance over the collection. Uh, in, in this example, we can say um, that a vector contains positive elements. All the elements of the vectors are positive. These are some of the methods in the vector API. Um, I'm gonna go over some of them. Uh, so the function new um, constructs a new vector, and the return type says uh, it's an empty one. The length uh, function gives me access to the length, and the, the type specify that the output value is exactly the, equal to the length of the, of the vector. The function push and pop use strong references to specify that the, the length of the vector at the output will be uh, one plus or one minus, what it was at the beginning, and the pop function also has a precondition saying that it cannot be called on non-empty vectors. Finally, the function index and index mute uh, have a precondition saying that when the, the index has to be within bounds. This is um, um, an implementation of the function I comment on the beginning uh, that generates a, a vector um, with all the elements within a range. Um, what I wanna point out here is that Flux is able to verify this without any extra annotations. That's the only thing we need to verify this function is just to put the, um, the type for the, the, the function and from then Flags can verify the code automatically. Um, and this is one of the main um, advantages uh, of our type-based approach, because this is not true for a type of tool. So for example, I'm, here I'm showing a comparison between Flax and Prusy, which is a state-of-the-art uh, verifier for Rust that is based on program logic. And if we try to verify the same code in, in Prusy, we will have to manually annotate the loop with a body invariant. And in this case, the, the invariant is not it's not trivial, it's saying a quantifying variant over the, the, the vector, and in Flux, uh, we don't need to do that. Like, um, the system can infer it automatically. And I'm claiming that the reason we can do that is because for, uh, by not having quantifiers, we can easily infer this invariance. So we did a quanti quantitative um, evaluation of this, uh, and for that we implemented um, a couple of algorithms that do um, vector operations, and we verify the absence, um, I mean, the, the safety of vector accesses. So the, li um, the column I'm highlighting here shows that the, the line take, lines taken by manually annotated body invariance is, can be not trivial, like uh, up to 24% in one of the examples, whether the column is like completely absent in flags. Uh, we don't need any of the invariance for these benchmarks. Um, the other thing I wanna point out is that uh, our times are consistently uh, one order of magnitude, like faster than Prusy. Although I don't want to draw too many conclusions here because there are many, many reasons uh, to explain the difference in time. In, in time. Although I wanna do point out that the queries that we're throwing to the SMT solver are very simple. And that's one of the reasons we are able to get uh, faster times. Uh, another thing we did, trying to evaluate whether Flux can be used to verify useful programs is port WAVE to Flux. So WAVE is a WebAssembly sandbox uh, sandboxing runtime that was previously uh, implemented in Rust and verified using Prusty. And we were able to port uh, the entirety of the code, verifying all the, the original um, properties they were verified. And this included that vectors are accessed within the, their bounds. Um, also that every memory access um, granted by the, the sandbox stays within the, the sandbox memory region, and also that all symbolic links um, and file paths are fully resolved uh, to point within the, the sandbox. Uh, so that's the end of my, my talk. Um, I'm, I show you how we can, using the ownership mechanism in Rust, we can extract a, a pure fragment that we can safely depend on and make verification easier. And I wanna leave you with a link to um, um, the code of Flux. You can go and download it and use it to prove whatever uh, you like, uh, want to prove in Rust. Thank you.
So if anyone has any questions, please come to the microphone. Hello. <coughs> uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm Zhe Zhou from Purdue University. Uh, notice that in your beginning of your slides, you say, in order to verify this reference, uh, you introduce your type system. Uh, I think that in general, if you want to combine the refinement type with the stateful thing, people use a whole type theory. Uh, do you have some bi-state specification? Uh, try to refine with the pre-state and post-state. If you add all of your ownership and this uh, sharing, this uh, constraint to this uh, state, uh, how to compare your work with the whole type theory with these constraints? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, so basically what, we, what we're doing is um, uh, using the, the Rust type system as a separation logic, right? So we separate all the spatial constraints from the pure constraints. Um, um, yeah, I, I don't know what more to say about that, but that's basically what's going on. Uh, we don't have, we, by using the Rust type system, we can obviate any spatial constraints uh, and just focus on the, on the pure constraints. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi, this is very exciting work. Um, this, especially with your strong references, started reminding me a lot of type state work that was occurring about 20 years ago, really popularly in the community. And I've just wondered if you've given any thought to taking the traditional stuff that would have been modeled via type state and adding it to the framework that you've just developed for Rust. Excuse me, what was the, the type, what? Type state. Ah, yes, that's something we've thought of. We don't have any concrete results, but something we believe this will be very useful for is type state. And we've, we've looked into like embedded systems. I think it will be a good fit for that type of stuff. I agree, that's exciting. <laughs> Hi, uh, Marcus from UBC. Um, so you mentioned that Flux does uh, approximations uh, at drawing points in, in Rust programs. Uh, but I also know that refinement types are able to keep some of this more precise information around using branch strengthening or something like that. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts about verifying unsafe code or code which doesn't have memory errors, but the Rust compiler says it doesn't know that it's safe. Yeah, we definitely have solved that. Like everyone doing verification in Rust is thinking about that. But <laughs> um, so my answer to that is that uh, the approach I'm gonna take uh, for that is providing more ex expressive abstractions over unsafe code. Like the same way you can um, have abstractions over unsafe code now, like vectors for example, we can give you lower level abstractions uh, that, are ref uh, that have refinement types on the, the signatures. Thank you. Okay. Can we have time for the last questions. Can you switch it on? Hi, uh, thank you for an interesting talk. I'm Jin Wang Zhong from KAIST. Uh, in the paper, you mentioned that you use the stack borrow model for your semantics. And to my understanding, uh, the stack borrow memory model is for uh, unsafe programs. And in my understanding, your, your flux type system doesn't work with the, under, uh, the unsafe programs. So I, I thought that using stack borrow might be a kind of an overkill for your uh, type system. So is there a, is there a uh, reason, reason why you choose uh, reason why I chose the stack borrow memory model? Yeah, um, so I, I don't have time to go into details into the type system, but about the, um, the proof of soundness, um, I will say that is kind of a, an overkill to use stack borrows because of the same reason you're mentioning, that is mostly meant for um, unsafe code. Uh, but the reason we did it is that we didn't want to depend on the details of, the, of lifetimes. Um, and we want to use a, a model that was verified, so that's why we use stack borrows. Um, a nice conse consequence of that is that gives you hints into what should be, um, when you're writing unsafe code that interacts with refinements, um, what should the, program, uh, the programmer like satisfied by themselves that the compiler cannot do for them? I don't know if that answered the questions. Uh, I think that answers the question. Okay. Thank you. I'm I know I've said we had enough time for two questions, but I'm afraid we're out. So hopefully we can carry this discussion afterwards.